Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, U.S. St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8th, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, U.E. St. Augustine. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Philip Emma In April 1967, I was 12 years old, and my country of birth, Nigeria, was torn apart by the earlier bloody military coup of January 15, 1966. During that coup, our Prime Minister, Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, was killed. Six months later, Nigeria was again torn apart by a bloody counter coup during which, which its new military president, Major General Johnson Aguirre was killed. By September 1966, up to 30,000 Igbo-speaking persons from the southeastern region of Nigeria, who were living in Nigeria but living outside Igbo land, were killed. The killings of Igbos were fueled by the anger over the earlier killings of prominent northern Nigerian leaders, including the first premier or governor of northern Nigeria, Sir Amadou Bello. Hundreds of northern Nigerians, mainly Hausa and Fulani speaking persons, that were living in Igbo land or in the southeastern region of Nigeria, were also killed. They were killed in retaliation for the killings of up to 30,000 Igbos who were living in northern Nigeria. In the aftermath of those killings of up to 30,000 Igbos, one million Igbo-speaking people fled to their ancestral Igbo land. I was one of those one million Igbos that became refugees in their own country, Biafra. In late April 1967, I fled as a refugee from my school dormitory. It was late morning and outside my dormitory called Irame House at St. George's College, Obinomba, Nigeria. I was a little surprised to see my mother, Mama, in front of Irame House. She traveled to Obinomba from our residence at the nurses' quarters of General Hospital, Abo. My seven-month-old brother, Peter, was strapped to her back with a swat of colorful Nigerian lapa cloth. In April 1967, the Nigerian ethnic killings and civil uprisings has worsened, and about a dozen Igbo-speaking students from the heart of Igbo land who we are studying at St. George's College. We are withdrawn by their parents. So without being told, I figured out that the reason Mama came to Obinomba was to withdraw me from St. George's College and that my family would be fleeing from Abo to our ancestral hometown of Onicha that was east of the River Niger. A few minutes after Mama's arrival, we were in the principal's office, waiting to pick up my school transcript as well as a testimonial letter that was written by my principal, Father Thomas Kennedy. I had a special relationship with Kennedy, whom I traveled with on every other Sunday morning and as an altar boy in the Catholic Church in Obiaroko and in the intimate chapels in Obinomba, Abavo, and Umutu. An hour after I had received my school transfer documents, 
Mama, Peter, and I boarded a taxi. The taxi was a five-passenger Peugeot 403 sedan that squeezed in eight adults, plus my eight-month-old brother, Peter. After traveling for 33 miles, we arrived at Abo Motor Park that was inside the main market of Abo. Up to 30,000 Igbos were killed in reprisal attacks that took place across the northern region of Nigeria. The new military government of the southeastern region of Nigeria was led by Colonel Odimebu Ojuku. He exploited the bad situation by fanning fears of ethnic cleansing. In major Igbo cities, including Onicha and Enugu, posters and cartoons warned Igbo-speaking people that Hausa and Fulani-speaking people will kill them unless they secede from Nigeria and form a new nation called Biafra. The irony lost on us Igbos was that 40% of Biafrans weren't Igbo-speaking people. Those 40% non-Igbos were the Efics, Ibibios, and Ijaws. As regional minorities, they resented how the Igbos dominated them during the era of the southeastern region of Nigeria. The non-Igbos in the new Biafra feared that Igbos would oppress them and preferred to remain in Nigeria. In early 1967, Igbo-speaking people within Nigeria who we are living outside the southeastern region of Nigeria, we are fleeing back to their ancestral Igbo lands. In late April 1967, my parents and seven children lived in a modest two-bedroom apartment. That apartment was one of the four nurses' residences that were known as the nurses' quarters of the General Hospital Abo, Midwest region, Nigeria. Within those four nurses' residences, our apartment was the one closest to the main road that led from Benin City to Abo to Anicha. The huge compound next to our front yard was the prison yards of Abo. As a staff nurse at, the, at that general hospital, my father was on call 24 hours a day and seven days a week. My, gra my maternal grandmother died in Onicha and on Christmas Eve of December 24, 1966. As a staff nurse on a 24-hour call, my father couldn't travel to Onicha that was only 50 miles away and do so to attend the funeral of his mother-in-law. As a nurse, my father assisted the surgeon and worked long shifts whenever a terrible road accident occurs near Abo. That general hospital was the only one for the 20-mile radius around Abo. That general hospital was the emergency room for automobile accidents that occurred along the roads leading from Benin City through Abo to Asaba. A frequently asked question was this. Who is the father of the supercomputer as it's known today? My contributions to the invention of the first world's fastest computer as it's known today and as it's expected to be known tomorrow we are these. I discovered that Amdahl's law as described in computer science textbooks and by so supercomputer scientists wasn't a law of physics. Amdahl's law was a law established by Jean Amdahl. The common 
interpretation of Amda's law was this. When one million processors are used to tackle one grand challenge problem, including the most difficult problems that arise in science, medicine, and mathematics, the supercomputer scientists could at most achieve an eightfold increase in speed rather than the millionfold increase that was hoped for. With that belief, that quote unquote, that quote unquote, Amda's law will get you. The supercomputer manufacturers of the 1970s and 80s only used up to four custom manufactured million dollar super fast processors rather than one million inexpensive slow processors as done today. The rationale of the leading supercomputer manufacturers was that supercomputing across the slowest processors will forever remain in the realm of science fiction. I'm the first person to know the fastest computer as it's known today. My contributions to the development of the world's fastest computer were these. I discovered how to circumvent Amda's law and how to do so by dividing one grand challenge problem of mathematics that's defined around a globe and dividing it into 65,536 lesser challenging problems and then solving them across a new internet that's a new global network of the 65,536 slowest processors in the world. Those processors are used to solve those 65,536 problems. They possess a one-to-one -one processor to problem correspondence between my new internet and the 65,536 smaller problems. I discovered that the Amda's law limit wasn't a physical limit. Amda's law was a limit maintained by our insufficient knowledge of how to assemble one billion processors and make them parallel to one billion problems that in turn we are created by dividing one compute intensive problem into one billion lesser challenging problems. In my scientific discovery that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, my world's fastest computing pushed Amdahl's limit by a factor of 65,536 fold down the road. Looking further in time, quantum computing could be the next fundamental change. However, I believe that the quantum computer will always have limited use. In the early 1980s, I embarked on my journey to the frontier of knowledge of the world's most powerful computers. I did so at a time every supercomputer scientist believed it would be impossible to harness one billion processors and use them as one coherent computer to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics, such as simulating global warming and solve them one billion times faster than one processor solving the same problem alone. I had to follow never before treaded pathways that took me to a new internet. The emails I sent traveled from the sending processor to the receiving processor. I had to know those pathways before I could achieve my one processor to one problem correspondence. 
my one-to-one -one mapping was a necessary condition to my bypassing the perceived limit in speed of the world's fastest computer. Textbooks describe that fictitious speed limit as a limit imposed by Amda's law. My discovery of the world of the first world's fastest computing across the supercomputer as it's known today was my experimental confirmation that my new global network of 64 binary thousand processors could be harnessed and used to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and solve them 64 binary thousand times faster than Amda's law limit decreed. The most powerful supercomputers are each powered by up to 10.65 million commodity self-contained processors which we are identical and shared nothing and cost up to 1 billion 250 million dollars each and it cost 40 percent more than the mile-long second niger bridge at onicha my ancestral hometown in nigeria in the 1980s there were 25,000 supercomputer scientists in the world. In the 1970s and 80s, the upper echelon of those supercomputing across a billion processors was sparsely populated. In the 1980s, I could use my fingers to count the programmers of the few massively parallel computers that existed back then, but that couldn't then be harnessed to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics. Until I discovered that quote unquote final proof on July 4, 1989, it was impossible to use the slowest processors in the world to emulate the world's fastest computer that was faster than any supercomputer. In the 1980s, I stood out among the 25,000 supercomputer scientists in the world. In that decade, I alone programmed 16 state-of-the-art supercomputers that were abandoned because they seemed impossible to program. Today, the most powerful supercomputer in the world costs 1 billion 250 million dollars each or the budget of a small nation. The reason those 16 fastest computer hopefuls were idle and available to me alone was that no programmer in the world except myself knew how to harness its up to 64 binary thousand processors which shared nothing. Nobody else knew how to harness a billion processors and how to use them to solve and reduce the time to solution of the most difficult problems in mathematics, physics, and computer science. The poster boy of the 20 most difficult problems in mathematics is the global climate model that must be used to foresee otherwise unforeseeable global warming. Each fastest computer hopeful of the 1980s that was then abandoned and dismissed as a colossal waste of everybody's time was waiting for me, Philip M. Agwale, to harness it as a new supercomputer. Today, 10,000 programmers can work together to use one computing machinery that's powered by 10 million processors and each programmer will be assigned 1,000 processors. That's one coherent and fast computer. But in the 1980s, I was the only full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputers in the, in the world. I knew that fact because in the 1980s, only one programmer 
can lock all the processors of such machineries and do so at once. And after I locked into each massively parallel supercomputer, I felt like I was home alone. I, Philip Emma Aguale, locked all the processors of my 16 supercomputer hopefuls of the 1980s. That was how I discovered how to harness the 65,536 slowest processors in the world. I was in the news because I discovered how to use the slowest processors to develop the fastest computers. My discovery of the world's fastest computing was in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. A student writing a school essay asked me, who is the father of the fastest computers? Any supercomputer scientist that's famous for his or her contributions to the development of the world's fastest computer that's powered by millions of processors was in his or her own way a father or a mother of the fastest computer. Seymour Cray was one of the fathers of the vector computer. However, the vector computer became obsolete on July 4, 1989, the date I discovered that the technology can't power the world's most powerful supercomputers. Therefore, Seymour Cray is definitely not a father of the massively parallel supercomputer that's the world's fastest computer. In his most famous quote, Seymour Cray ridiculed and dismissed the harnessing of millions of processors. He described the new technology as science fiction supercomputing. Computer science textbook authors also wrote that thousands of processors could not be utilized to simultaneously solve the hardest problems in science, engineering, and medicine. In the 1980s, Seymour Cray taunted the parallel computing community. If you were plowing a field, which would you rather use? Two strong oxen or 1,024 chickens? In the 1980s, only one person could be at the farthest frontier of the most massively parallel supercomputing. In the late 1980s, that farthest frontier was outlined by a spherical island of 64 binary thousand off-the-shelf processors. I, Philip M. Aguale, invented a new internet, and I contributed new knowledge at the farthest frontier of computer science, where the fastest computation occurs. My new internet was powered by my new global network of 64 binary thousand off-the-shelf processors. That's equivalent to a new supercomputer that's powered by a new spherical island of as many identical computers that we are in constant dialogue with each other. I'm the first eyewitness from that farthest frontier of the fastest computing that can be executed across up to a billion processors. In the 1980s, I was the lone large-scale computational scientist at that jagged multidisciplinary frontier of human knowledge that was a crossroad where new calculus, largest scaled algebra, highest resolution computational physics, and fastest computing intersect. I conducted my research alone, and I did so at that undiscovered territory where the fastest computing can be discovered. 
In the 1980s, everybody else believed that the fastest computing across the slowest processors will forever remain in the realm of science fiction and will be an enormous waste of everybody's time. The speech of then US President Bill Clinton of August 26, 2000 was an important moment of validation of my contribution of fastest computing to the development of the supercomputer. For me, Philip M. Aguale, my world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors was motivated by my need to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics. Such problems are described as initial boundary value problems. Most often, a boundary value problem is governed by a system of complicated partial differential equations, such as the mathematical, such as the mathematical representation of a global climate model, which began in the realm of science fiction when it was first published on February 1, 1922. Science deals with facts, while fiction deals with truths. On June 20, 1974, in Covalis, Oregon, USA, I commenced my search for the truth within that science fiction story that was published on February 1, 1922. I began my science fiction quest by visualizing my theorized world's fastest computing and doing so in a four-dimensional space-time continuum. When computing with only one processor, I visualized time division without space division. But in my world's fastest computing of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, which occurred across my ensemble of 65,536 processors. I visualized both time and space divisions. From my back of the envelope estimation, serial and automatic computing yields one order of magnitude increase over mechanical or analog computing. I reasoned that my first world's fastest computing across four-dimensional space-time will yield four orders of magnitude increase in the speed of solving the most difficult problems in mathematics. The world's fastest computer is a necessary but not sufficient machinery for solving the most difficult problems in mathematics. Such tough problems arise as large-scale geophysical fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics informed simulations are central to understanding the spread of contagious viruses in the Nigerian buses that pack passengers like sardines. To invent is to make the previously unseen seen. My invention was that I made the 65,536 slowest processors in the world, which was previously unseen as a supercomputer, to be seen as the world's fastest computer. My new supercomputer became a new internet in reality. My invention was that I visualized my theorized world's fastest computer as a reality. In the 1970s, that machinery was the world's slowest computer, and the technology only existed in the realm of science fiction. I visualized its inner workings correctly, and did so before the new technology could manifest itself as the 65,536 slowest processors in the world that I used on July 4, 1989 to record the fastest speed in computing. I'm the only father of the internet that invented a new internet 
that's a new supercomputer. I visualize my new supercomputer not as a new computer by or in itself, but as a new internet in reality. I visualize my new internet as a new global network of two raised to power 16 processors. I harness those processors as one coherent supercomputer and did so by maintaining a one processor to one vertex mapping and correspondence with the as many vertices of the cube in the 16-dimensional hyperspace. To achieve the fastest speed, I uniformly distributed my processors across the surface of a sphere that I also visualized as tightly circumscribed by a cube. I visualized that world's fastest computer and did so 15 years in advance and did so before my invention took place. That new supercomputer that manifested itself for the first time back at 8.15 in the morning on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, was the world's fastest computer that I used to solve the most difficult problem in mathematics, which I solved across the 65,536 lowest processors in the world. That new supercomputer began as a tiny acorn or as the singular slowest processor in the world. That processor multiplied to become my ensemble of two raised to power 16 processors. My ensemble became a mighty oak tree in the world of mathematics and became the world's most powerful and fastest computer. The fastest computer in the world occupies the space of a soccer field. My visualizations, which I achieved through my geometrical metaphors of a cube that was tightly embedded within a sphere, was what inspired me to believe that computing across billions of processors, which was science fiction in the 1970s and 80s, could become the science non-fiction of 1989. To discover the world's fastest computing and to invent the technology in 1989 was to make the unimaginable to compute possible to supercompute. In 1989, I invented how to use a billion processors to execute the world's fastest computing and solve otherwise unintractable problems arising beyond the frontier of calculus. Such physics problems define the crux of the 20 most difficult problems in supercomputing. They include, uh, they include detailed weather forecasting, climate modeling, simulations of production oil fields, and large-scale computational fluid dynamics. I achieved the greatest speed and accuracy by discovering that up to a billion processors could compute in tandem to solve as many problems. In 1989, I was in the news because I invented how to solve difficult mathematical problems in extreme scale computational physics. I invented how to solve the world's most compute intensive problems and solve them across up to a billion coupled processors. I was the first person to record the fastest computer speed alone. I was the first person to demonstrate how to harness up to a billion processors, how to communicate synchronously, how to compute simultaneously, and, and how to do both across a new internet. 
First, I invented that new internet as my new global network of 65,536 off-the-shelf processors and standard parts. Second, I also invented that new internet as my new global network of 65,536 identical processors. In 1989, it made the news headlines that an African supercomputer genius in the USA had discovered how to make the unimaginable to compute possible to supercompute. I discovered it's possible to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics, in computational physics, and solve them across an ensemble of up to one billion processors that I invented as a new internet that's a new global network of processors. After studying calculus full time and for the 20 years that followed June 20, 1970, I understood the abstract mathematics that was behind the partial differential equations at the farthest frontier of calculus. And my mathematical maturity that grew over two decades enabled me to program all my 65,536 processors and do so without physically touching any of those processors. In 1989, I was in the news because my world's fastest computing delivered immediate results. It was a knockout. So I had to know exactly where each of my two raised to power 16 or 64 binary thousand processors was at and know their unique email addresses. I used those 65,536 email addresses of the as many processors of that new internet and used them as their binary reflected identification numbers. My light bulb eureka moment occurred when I visualized that new internet in the shape of the hypercube within the hypersphere in the hyperspace of 16 dimensions. The world's fastest computing across millions of coupled off-the-shelf processors that shared nothing that each operated its operating system is advantageous in triple M modeling. That's the acronym for multi-scale, multi-physics, and multi-level simulations. In computational physics, triple M models are mathematical representations of phenomena at disparate scales. The system of nine Philip M. Aguali equations is part of the mathematical representations of the motions of oil, injected water, and natural gas that flow up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and across an oil producing field that's often the size of Abuja, Nigeria. A school essay question is this, what is Philip Emma Aguale most famous for? In 1989, I was in the news because I proved something that wasn't proven then in any mathematics, physics, or computer science textbook. I proved that the slowest processors in the world could be used to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics. Furthermore, I discovered how to solve the most difficult problems in computing and solve them at the fastest speeds in the world. I was the first person to prove that the world's fastest computers can be powered, can be powered by the world's slowest processors. That discovery that occurred on July 4, 1989, made it possible for the fastest computers of today to leave science fiction books and enter science 
enter science textbooks. I was in the news because I discovered how to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics, physics, and computer science. The grand challenge problem, I leapfrogged from slowest processing to fastest computing. The grand challenge problem that I discovered how to solve is to the world's fastest computer what Hamlet is to the play, the Prince of Denmark. Supercomputing without solving the most difficult problem in mathematics is like staging the play, Hamlet, without the Prince of Denmark. My supercomputer breakthrough that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, was how to compute the fastest and do so with the slowest processors in the world. My scientific discovery was that the fastest computer or supercomputer in the world can emerge from the bowels of an ensemble of the slowest processors in the world. A school essay question is this. What did Philip Emma Aguale invent? I invented how to develop the world's fastest computers from the world's slowest processors. My invention laid the foundation for the precursor to the fastest computers of today. My invention is embodied inside the fastest computers that are now powered by hundreds of identical processors. My invention is embodied inside the state-of-the-art supercomputers. The world's fastest computers are powered by millions of processors that shared nothing, but we are in dialogue with each other. My invention of fastest computing is the reason school essays are written on the contributions of Philip M. Aguale to science. My invention is the reason it's no longer said that parallel supercomputing is a beautiful theory that lacks an experimental confirmation. I invented fastest computing from slowest processing. For me, Philip M. Aguale, Inventing the world's fastest computer was like assembling 65,536 pieces of puzzle and doing so to see a never-before-seen Ireland that is one coherent supercomputer, or rather a new internet that coalesced as the fastest computer in the world back at 8.15 in the morning of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. If the supercomputer scientist could wave a magic wand that will enable her to solve the most difficult problem in mathematics, or a problem that captures the public's imagination, her request would be this, a demand for an unlimited number of processors to be used to materialize the fastest computing that will enable her to foresee otherwise unforeseeable long-term global warming, as well as deeply understand how to control the spread of COVID-19. How do we develop the world's fastest computer? How do we invent a new supercomputer? How are the world's fastest computers made? People often ask, how is the supercomputer different from the computer? The world's fastest computer weighs as much as 8,000 Africans and is 20 million times more powerful than your laptop. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered the world's fastest computing. 
I discovered how a million processors can coordinate and work together to solve the same problem. I discovered how to harness a billion processors and do so to solve one complex and time-consuming problem that would be otherwise impossible to solve. My contribution to the development of the world's fastest computers is this. I discovered that an ensemble of a billion processors that are locked together can be programmed to emulate one seamless coherent machinery that's a new supercomputer in reality. I discovered that the number of processors needed to compute fastest is proportional to the compute intensiveness of the problem. More often than not, the most difficult problems in mathematics arise as variations in the calculations called computational fluid dynamics. The mathematical structure of the global climate model differs slightly from that of the petroleum reservoir simulation that I presented in 1989. Both are prototypical problems of large-scale computational fluid dynamics. How are the most powerful computers used? The most powerful computers are powered by millions of coupled processors. Supercomputers are instruments of modern science that must be used to make scientific discoveries and techni technical breakthroughs. The fastest computers are used to predict the paths of hurricanes, predict when an earthquake might occur, predict global warming, understand gene therapy, discover new molecules that could lead to new drugs for combating a global pandemic, and more accurately forecast the spread of the coronavirus through communities and to test the impact of various social distancing measures. Supercomputing helps discover antiviral drugs and develop vaccines in months rather than in years. The fastest computing across a billion processors is both a journey and a destination. My scientific discovery of the world's fastest computing fueled the quest for a new destination, namely the next horizon in supercomputing. That new horizon is called quantum computing. How to develop the spread of COVID-19? How to model the spread of COVID-19? Within that new horizon resides in the realm of science fiction. How to simulate the weather within that new horizon is still beyond our understanding. Fastest computing across an ensemble of a billion processors changed the logic of sequential computing. That logic changed from solving one problem at a time to solving many problems at once or in parallel. The fundamental change was this. The sequential thought processes of the past were replaced with parallel thought processes of the present. A theory is not positively true. In the 1970s and 80s, my research quest was for the solution of the most compute-intensive problems in high-performance supercomputing and as large-scale computational fluid dynamics. In retrospect, and in the language of the world's fastest computer, the most important question in computer science is this. How can we use 10.65 million processors and use them to invent how to compress 10.65 million days or 30,000 years of time to solution within one processor to merely one day 
of timed solution across a spherical island of 10.65 million processors. The news media, including the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal, noted that I, Philip M. Aguale, discovered how to use as the world's fast, fastest computer a new internet that I invented and how to use that technology as a new global network of up to 1 billion off-the-shelf processors or as a spherical island of as many identical computers. I invented how to use that new internet to reduce 65,536 days or 108 years of time to solution within one processor. I invented how to reduce that 108 years of time to solution to barely one day of time to solution across a new global network of 65,536 processors which outlined and defined my new internet. How do we achieve a quantum leapfrog to the fastest computer? The reason my experimental breakthrough made the news headlines in 1989 was that I, so to speak, opened 65,536 doors to the unknown world of fastest computing. That invention was a quantum leap in time to solution of 16 orders of magnitude. It yielded a speed increase of a factor of 2 raised to power 16, or, 65, or a 65,536-fold increase in supercomputer speed. My invention opened doors to the then undiscovered territory of supercomputing across the slowest processors. My supercomputer breakthrough opened 10,649,600 doors that led to the world's fastest computer of today that's powered by as many processors. The quantum increase in speed that I discovered is my contribution to the development of the computer and the supercomputer. My speed increase made the news because it moved the boundaries of fastest computing forward. My contribution to computer science enables the world's fastest computer to compute a million times faster than the regular computer. I discovered how to make the world's fastest computer a billion times faster. On July 4, 1989, I experimentally discovered fastest computing that's faster by a factor of 65,536. That is, I moved the precursor of the world's fastest computer forward and moved it from the theoretical level of quote unquote. What if it can be done to the practical level of, quote unquote, how to do it? What is a fundamental change in computing? For thousands of years, our human ancestors counted with their fingers and on their toes. 3,000 years ago, an alternative way of counting that used computing aids such as the counting board and the abacus was invented. That alternative way was a fundamental change in the way we look at the computer. The fastest computing across up to a billion processors is the biggest fundamental change in the history of the computer. Fastest computing across billions of processors is supercomputing's defining technical achievement. Computing could be around as long as the river flows and the grass grows. After my discovery, which occurred on July 4, 1989, historians of computer science can no longer mock and ridicule the technique of fastest computing 
across slowest processes, they cannot dismiss it as a beautiful theory that lacks an experimental confirmation. What will the world be like if we have a massively parallel supercomputer that's the size of the universe? Over the past century, the average lifespan increased by about 20 years. If that increase in lifespan continues for another century, the average person could live to age 100. In a century, those extra 20 years could be years of living without the threat of cancer. How do we upgrade a fictional supercomputer to a reality? When I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974 at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, USA, I lacked both the knowledge and the 65,536 processors that I needed to experimentally confirm my discovery, namely that parallel supercomputing is not science fiction. I discovered that the first world's fastest supercomputing across a billion processors is a reality across a new internet that was a new global network of processors. My supreme quest was for how to execute the world's fastest computation and do so not on a computer in and of itself, but across a new global network of identical processors that I invented as a new internet. How can you visualize the world's fastest computer as an internet? I'm the only father of the internet that invented an internet. When I came of age, back in the 1970s and 80s, it was science fiction to speculate on how to execute the fastest computations and do so to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and solve them across a new internet. In the 1970s and 80s, I had a geometry metaphor for my new internet. In my metaphor, I visualized the cube as inscribed inside a sphere with both defined and embedded within the 16th dimension. In hyperspace, that hypercube and hypersphere gave my new internet regular form and freedom. Not only that, I used that form and freedom to visualize my new internet as quote-unquote parallel to the grand challenge initial boundary value problem of extreme scale computational fluid dynamics that I must solve. This is the most difficult problem in large scale computational and in large scale mathematical and computational physics. My discovery of 1989 of how to solve this problem on the world's fastest computer enables us to understand how COVID-19 spreads across Nigerian buses that pack, passen that pack passengers like sardines. My contribution to computer science is this. On July 4, 1989, I discovered how to compute one billion times faster and do so across one billion processors that surrounded a globe and did so just as the internet now encircles the earth. A new supercomputer creates a new science. Like a storm at sea, fastest computing across a million processors has brutally pushed computer science in a new direction and created new fields of study. A million processors supercomputing in tandem changed the course of mathematics. My contribution led to a deeper understanding 
of the internet of tomorrow that could become the supercomputer of tomorrow. My contribution to the world's fastest computing is this. I invented how to email problems and do so one billion times faster and do so to and from across one billion processors that surrounded a globe as an internet. But on July 4, 1989, I recorded the world's fastest computation and did so across the world's slowest processors and across a new global network of 16 times to raise to power 16 or 1,048,576 bidirectional email wires. My wires had a one-to-one -one correspondence to the as many bidirectional edges of the cube in the 16th dimension. I visualized my sphere and cube as embedded within the 16th dimension and as a hypersphere and a hypercube within a hyperspace. Please allow me to reintroduce myself. I'm Philip M. Magwale. I'm a dreamer who dreamt fiction as non-fiction. I expanded the story of science to become a part of that story and the witness. My discovery of how to harness a billion processors and use them to synchronously solve the most difficult problems in mathematics made the new set lines shortly after it occurred on July 4, 1989. How can you visualize the world's fastest computing? We all use geometrical metaphors every time we say, we say on the other hand, up or down. I discovered that my geometrical metaphor of a hypercube that was tightly circumscribed by a hypersphere that was embedded in hyperspace gave my new internet regular form and freedom because of that regularity and uniformity in the 16-dimensional hyperspace, each of my two raised to power 16 of the shelf processors could, communicate, could directly communicate with its 16 nearest neighboring processors and exchange data via emails and do so with its 16 nearest neighboring processors that shared nothing. How are Philip Emma Gwali's inventions used. A school essay question is this. How is the Philip M. Aguale fastest computer used? My short answer is that the supercomputer could be as useful as the computer. As a mathematician who spent two decades searching for new calculus and new algebra, I discovered that the supercomputer workload from my solution of initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics, such as modeling global warming and doing so across one billion processors, increased the speed of the supercomputer and increased it by a factor of one billion. My invention made the parallel supercomputer the new normal and relegated the vector supercomputer to computer museums. My discovery opened the doors that made it possible to harness a billion processors and use them in parallel to accelerate the speeds of compute-intensive petroleum reservoir simulations that were developed in the USA and used in African oil-producing nations. My discovery was used to find new deposits of crude oil and natural gas in the Niger Delta region of southern Nigeria. My invention was used to create geological models of the producing oil fields of Saudi Arabia. My invention was used to analyze data from seismic surveys of producing oil fields of Russia. An oil producing field is up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and often the size of Alexandria, Egypt. 
My scientific discovery that occurred on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, made the news headlines. My discovery that the world's fastest computers can be built from standard parts called processors was a scientific breakthrough because it provided new knowledge of how to distribute and process seismic data and do both within and across compute nodes. My discovery inspired the use of the supercomputer that's powered by millions of processors. The fastest computers are used to simulate drilling in oil wells, oil fields, to figure out where to drill for crude oil and natural gas, to decide how many oil wells to drill, and to increase the output per oil well. The world's fastest computer that's powered by up to 1 billion processors was an invention that followed my discovery of parallel processing. The knowledge of how to solve the so-called grand challenge of supercomputing and do so across up to a billion processors pre-existed. But it was unknown until I discovered that parallel, that parallel processing can simultaneously yield the highest speed-ups across an internet. On July 4, 1989, I discovered that fastest speed, that fastest speed across a virtual supercomputer that's a global network of 65,536 coupled processors that shared nothing and that's an internet in reality. The world's fastest computer is the vital technology that posterity must harness and use to move humanity forward. I came of age in the 1970s and 80s. In those two decades, the terra incognita that was, emerge, that was the emerging field of fastest computing across a million processors was as empty as a ghost town that had only one permanent resident. I was that permanent resident at the farthest frontier of fastest computing. My new internet was a small copy of a never before understood internet that outlined and defined that that's outlined and defined by its 65,536 processors that encircled a globe instead of billions of computers around a globe. I visualized each of my two to power 16 off-the-shelf processors as equal distances apart and around a globe in a 16-dimensional hyperspace. And I visualize my ensemble of processors as evenly distributed across the hyperspace of, of a hypersphere, across the hypersurface of a hypersphere in a 16-dimensional hyperspace. I visualize my ensemble of processors as outlining a new internet which I visualized in my 16-dimensional hyperspace. What is Philip Emma Aguale known for? I discovered how to combine computers into a supercomputer that's an internet. That discovery is like a light from an ancient sky. I'm the only father of the internet that invented an internet. In the early 1980s, I was discouraged from doing what white scientists were allowed to do. I was discouraged from programming a $40 million vector supercomputer that was in Camp Springs, Maryland. I was discouraged from using another vector supercomputer 
that was in San Diego, California. I was discouraged from using supercomputers, also bought with black tax dollars. Because I wasn't allowed to program vector supercomputers, I was forced to program only massively parallel supercomputers, which in the 1970s and 80s were the most undesirable to program to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics. A school essay question is this. How did Philip Emma Aguale change the way we look at the fastest computers in the world? In the early 1980s, my unproven idea of the fastest computing across the slowest processors was mocked and ridiculed as a beautiful theory that lacks an experimental confirmation. In the 1970s and 80s, fastest computing across a new internet that a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors was still in the realm of science fiction. But on the 4th of July, 1989, the day I discovered the fastest speed in computing, it didn't matter that I had no research budget or that I was black and sub-Saharan African. What mattered was that the new way of fastest computing fundamentally changed the way we look at the modern computer and change the way we solve the toughest problems in mathematics arising in computational physics or arise in large-scale computational algebra and arise as the complicated partial differential equation that governs initial boundary value problems at the frontiers of calculus, algebra, and physics that define the most important applications of the supercomputer that's a $45 billion a year industry. My quest was to use my new internet as my new, as my test bed for solving the toughest problems that arise in mathematics, science, engineering, and medicine. My fastest computing theory was that the one and only one technique for solving the most difficult problems in mathematics in supercomputing that span across algebra, calculus, and physics was to reformulate each problem. For that reason, I chopped up the most compute-intensive problems into an equivalent set of 1 billion initial boundary value problems that can then be solved across one billion processors and solved with a one problem to one processor correspondence. To be exact, I must experimentally confirm my world's fastest computing theory as true and across processors. At 8.15 in the morning, in the morning, on July 4, 1989, I confirmed my fastest computing theory. I did so by executing the world's fastest computation and by using my ensemble of 65,536 processors to solve my 65,536 initial boundary value problems that defined the whole grand challenge problem, including global climate modeling for climate changes. My contribution to physics is this. I effectively remove the adjective grand from the phrase grand challenge problems of physics. In 1982, I gave a lecture on, on the world's fastest computing. That lecture was mocked as science fiction. I was ridiculed because my theorized speed increase of a factor of 65,536 across as many processors was then believed to be impossible to attain. 
15 years earlier, between April 18 to 20, 1967, a revered supercomputer expert named Jim Amdahl, quote unquote, discovered Amdahl's law. In essence, Amdahl's law decreed that supercomputing across the world's slowest processors will forever remain in the realm of science fiction. During the following 22 years, Amdahl's law convinced supercomputer manufacturers to continue to use only one, two, or four custom-made processors to power their machine, their machineries. My theory was that thousands or millions or even billions of processors should be used to power the world's fastest computers. On July 4, 1989, I discovered that fa that fastest computing across slowest processors is not science fiction. In 1989, it was an epiphany for me to discover that in my supercomputing across my global network of processors, that my speed increase of a factor of 64 binary thousand fold would have been impossible if I didn't communicate across my new global network of email wires. Emails married my processors together. Emails outlined and defined my new internet that enshrouded a globe. As a mathematician who came of age in the 1970s and 80s, the lesson I learned was this. The ordinary genius insists on programming only the processors within the network of his email wires and processors. The magical genius discovers she must command and control all her two raised to power 16 or 65,536 processors. She must control them via their 16 times two raised to power 16 or 1,048,576 email wires. The high performance, massively parallel supercomputer genius who embarked on a quest for the world's fastest computer of the 1980s must look along 16 mutually perpendicular directions in hyperspace. That supercomputer genius must understand how to program across billions of processors that uniformly outline a globe that's a metaphor for the Earth. In the 1970s and 80s, I visualized myself as a person who discovered the world's fastest computing computer in hyperspace. I visualized myself as a programmer of the supercomputer or rather as a conductor of an ensemble of billions of processors. That ensemble of processors wasn't a computer by or in itself. That global network of processors was a new internet in reality. In 1989, I was in the news because I was the first supercomputer conductor to orchestrate the humongous email communications. Among my 65,536 processors, I executed them automatically. I sent and received emails across what was topologically speaking, the surface of a globe that had two raised to power 16 or 65,536 processors uniformly distributed across that globe. That invention was a new internet that I visualized as a small copy of the internet. I'm the only father of the internet that invented an internet. An African-born scientist conducting research at the farthest frontiers of knowledge of mathematics, physics, and computer science, 
and doing so in the USA needs an enlightened American female research scientist who is also of African descent and needs her to succeed. That African-born research scientist needs an American-born research scientist as his anchor and grounding force. I met my wife, Dale, on the second Tuesday of June, 1978, in Baltimore, Maryland. Dale was born in Baltimore and as an American of African descent. We were both research scientists in Washington, D.C. In the 1980s, my wife Dale was an award-winning scientist. As a research scientist, Dale was then better known than I was, and she was my role model. A question in high school essays is this. What is the contribution of Philip M. Aguale to physics? My contribution to physics is this. I extended the borders of knowledge of modern physics to include large-scale computational physics that's executed across millions of processors. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered how to solve the most difficult problem in a branch of physics that's called extreme scale computational fluid dynamics. Such compute intensive problems include the fastest computing and the large scale modeling of the flow patterns of water and air that occur during hurricanes and tornadoes. The accurate predictions of the occurrences of hurricanes and tornadoes help protect lives and properties. I discovered how to execute the fastest computing of aerodynamic flows that must be used to design hypersonic aircraft. I discovered how to compute in tandem large-scale codes in computational fluid dynamics. The fastest computational fluid dynamics codes must be used to design the most efficient shape that reduces the drag on a submarine and an automobile. I solved that initial boundary value problem that's governed by partial differential equations at the frontiers of calculus and computational fluid dynamics. And I solved it by drawing on both my physical and geometric intuitions, both as a physicist and a geometer, and drawing on my mathematical analogies between meteorology and geology, and creating metaphors between the globe in its third and sixteenth dimensions. In the late afternoons from the late 1970s through the 80s and 90s, I decompressed by jogging across the Rock Creek Trail of Silver Spring, Maryland, or playing tennis in Covalis, Oregon, or at the two tennis courts that were next to the Penumbra Theater of St. Paul, Minnesota. In the early 1990s, I stayed physically fit by jogging up to 50 miles a week. I trained for 26 mile marathon races and did so around the 70 and half acre lake, acre Lake Como, that was my backyard of the Bolentin of Energy Park of St. Paul, Minnesota. What's a decade? in the life of a physicist. As a research physicist, my specialty was fluid dynamics, particularly large-scale computational hydrodynamics. Back from September 1, 1981 through August 1986, 
I lived a 15-minute stroll from the Greymax Heliport building in Silver Spring, Maryland. The Greymax building was an approved landing pad for helicopters. The Greymax building was the then headquarters of the U.S. National Weather Service. During those five years, and from Mondays through Fridays, I stopped each morning and spent five hours with hydrologists and meteorologists. I did so on my way to the nearby metro station of Silver Spring, Maryland. From Silver Spring, from metro station, and after lunch, I rode a small shuttle bus to College Park, Maryland, where I spent the rest of my day in research seminars given by visiting mathematicians, physicists, and computer scientists. At about 6 o'clock in the evening, I played tennis at one of the 14 lighted tennis courts at the nearby Fieldhouse Drive of College Park, Maryland. During my five years, from 1981 to 1986, with research meteorologists, I was inspired to investigate the finite difference discretizations of the primitive equations of meteorology that were used by the U.S. National Weather Service and used to forecast the weather. Earlier and before my arrival at the U.S. National Weather Service, and in the three years that were inclusive from 1978 through 1981, I researched in the fluid dynamics of both free surface water flows and subsurface flows of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that were flowing through porous media. A typical porous medium is an oil-producing field that can be up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep. In those three years, I lived in the bustling Adams Morgan neighborhood and in the Meridian Hill Hall that was next to the Malcolm X Park and along the 16th Street of Washington, D.C., of Washington, District of Columbia. During the 10 years that followed June 5, 1977, I moved around and between Washington, District of Columbia, Baltimore, Maryland, Silver Spring, Maryland, College Park, Maryland, Casper, Wyoming, and Laramie, Wyoming. In those 10 years, and those cities, I attended about 500 advanced scientific lectures. It was a rare achievement for a supercomputer scientist to attend that many lectures, that many seminars. Each seminar was at the frontiers of knowledge in mathematics, physics, and computer science. Attending those 500 scientific lectures enabled me to have far more knowledge and command of materials than any supercomputer scientist on YouTube, and to become the multidisciplinary mathematician who posted 1,000 multidisciplinary videos on, Emma, on the Emma Aguali YouTube channel. That was the reason I was, I was described as an autodidact and the person who invented the world's fastest computing across up to a billion processors. In the 1970s and 80s, it was impossible to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and physics, such as forecasting the weather, and solve them across a million processors. For that reason, I had to invent, not learn, how to solve the world's biggest problems by executing the first world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors that shared nothing with each other. Like other inventors, I invented fastest computing without the benefit of a supercomputer instructor. That is, I was the first person to understand how to harness the world's fastest computing as we know the technique today. In the 1980s, I attended 500 lectures on the latest scientific discoveries. Each lecture was delivered by the discoverer or inventor who was a leading mathematician or physicist 
or computer scientist. After 10 years of daily conversations with the foremost thinkers at the frontiers of knowledge, I became a multidisciplinary mathematician who can discover new physics and invent a new computer that's fastest. That was how I became known. For my contributions to the development of the world's fastest computer, I discovered the world's fastest computer across the slowest processors in the world. I discovered the world's fastest computer on the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, and across an ensemble of 65,536 processors. A question in school essays is this. What is the Philip Emma Aguale internet? I visualize my new internet as a new global network of 64 binary thousand or 65,536 off-the-shelf processors. That internet was married together as one seamless, coherent, and gigantic supercomputer and married by one binary million email wires or 1,048,576 wires that were uniformly distributed around a globe. But I visualize my globe to be shaped as what mathematicians call a hypersphere in the 16th dimensional hyperspace. My discovery of a new internet that's a new global network of processors and that's a new supercomputer was a moment of revelation and insight. I discovered how to harness the trillions of processors and the billions of computers that could outline and define the internet of the future. I discovered how the planetary supercomputer of forthcoming centuries could look like a planet-sized supercomputer that harnesses all the processors and computers on Earth and uses them to solve a difficult problem in mathematics and physics, must by necessity require that all emails be at once sent and synchronously received across the Earth. The processing nodes of that planet-sized supercomputer must be uniformly distributed across the Earth. That scientific discovery was my eureka moment of revelation. It helped me to understand that harnessing a billion processors is the key to making the supercomputer fastest. That scientific discovery was how I gained insight into the essential meaning of a global network of off-the-shelf processors that were coupled and identical to each other. It was a global network of identical email wires that I visualized as tightly circumscribing a hyperglobe in hyperspace. That new technology was a new internet that was comprised of 65,536 processors. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered that those 64 binary thousand processors can be used to emulate one seamless, coherent, and gigantic processor that was at the processing core of the world's fastest computer. That new computer and new internet are like two sides of the same coin that are different, but yet congruent and necessary. The head side of the coin contains the ensemble of processors. The tail side of the coin contains the ensemble of email wires. The head and tail sides are married to each other to form the new internet called the Philip M. Aguale Internet. I'm the only father of the internet that invented an internet. 
A new supercomputer was born at 8.15 in the morning of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. That new supercomputer used the slowest processors in the world to execute the fastest processing in the world. That new supercomputer fundamentally changed the way we look at the computer. The world's fastest computer consumes enough power to run 10,000 homes. A supercomputer communicates across up to 200 miles of cables. The world's fastest computer occupies 8,000 square feet of floor space and comprises of hundreds of racks, millions of processors, endless wires, and blinking lights. That new supercomputer is not a computer by or in itself. That new supercomputer is a new internet in reality. In a dream, my new internet appeared to me like a deity. That supreme power enshrouds the earth as an electronic clot. I imagine that deity to be the global planet sized super brain for our descendants of forthcoming millennia. That super brain could be a billion trillion coupled super intelligent processors. My epiphany was the Eureka moment when I comprehended that the internet of year million could evolve to become the core of the earth-sized supercomputer of our post-human gods. For the past century, weather forecasting, the precursor to climate modeling, was the poster boy of the least of the two most difficult problems in mathematics and physics. Fastest computing across a globe was speculated and entered into the realm of science fiction, and did so when it was first published on February 1, 1922. Fast forward 67 years, I was in the news because Breaking that supercomputer speed of barrier was computing's equivalence of being the first person to summit the peak of Mount Everest or climb to the top of the world. The science fiction of today could become the non-fiction of tomorrow. On February 1, 1922, a science fiction human supercomputer was described as 64,000 humans calculating together to forecast the weather for the entire Earth. I stumbled onto that science fiction story while I was working as a university librarian in Monmouth, Oregon, USA, in the summer of 1974. I reformulated that idea of 1922 as the first world's fastest computing across an internet. I visualize my new internet as a new global network of 64,000 computers. Back in 1974, my internet was mocked as a blue sky thinking. In that decade, fastest computing across up to a billion processors remained in the realm of science fiction. 60, 67 years later, on the 4th of July, 1989, that science fiction manifested as a non-fiction across a new internet. I visualize the Philip M. Aguale internet as a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors around a globe. I visualize that globe as a hypersphere in a 16-dimensional hyperspace. My visualization differed from the 64,000 human computers around the globe in three-dimensional space. After the 4th of July, 1989, fastest computing across up to a billion processors or using one million processors to solve the same problem and do so at once left my experimental supercomputing laboratory. My invention 
or new knowledge entered every supercomputer that has been manufactured since my scientific discovery of 1989. A question in school essays on famous physicists and their discoveries is this. What did Philip Emma Aguale contribute to physics? My discoveries and contributions to physics are these. The slowest processors in the world can be used to manufacture the fastest computers in the world that can be used to solve the most difficult problems in physics. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered that up to 1 billion self-contained processors could be utilized to forecast tomorrow's weather and deeply understand next, next century's climate change. I invented the Philip M. Aguale internet, but it was renamed and credited to a white inventor. I solved the most difficult problem in computational mathematics, and I solved it alone. That grand challenge problem, namely the world's fastest computing across the world's lowest processors, solving the world's most compute intensive problems, was indirectly and first posed seven decades earlier. I was the first person to sketch a new internet. The idea that suddenly the internet was invented in the 1970s just doesn't ring true. That said, I was the first person to sketch a new internet. My new internet was a global network of processors that emulated one seamless, coherent, and gigantic supercomputer. My invention made the news headlines because it materialized as the world's fastest computer. For these 15 years following 1974, my not so fully formed hypothesis that was published on February 1, 1922, continuously grew in my mind. It became my fully formed theory that I constructively reduced to practice. It physically materialized as my new global network of the 64 binary thousand slowest processors in the world that seamlessly computed as one coherent supercomputer that became the world's fastest computer. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered a fundamental change in computational physics. Someone asked, what's the most fundamental change that occurred in computational physics? A century ago, the physics model of the spread of the coronavirus disease could only have been formulated on the blackboard. Half a century ago, the spread of COVID-19 could be modeled on a computer, but that was, that was powered by only one processor. Today, a supercomputer that's powered by up to 10 million processors can be used to model the spread of COVID-19 across a Nigerian bus that packs passengers like sardines. That sea change from modeling on a blackboard to a motherboard is the world's fast to, to motherboard to the world's fastest computer is the most fundamental change in computational physics. It was a quantum shift from the February 1, 1922 science fiction and paradigm of 64 thousand human computers that we are quote unquote racing the weather for the globe. My 1974 theory of the world's fastest computer was about as many processors or computers working together to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and physics and solve them across my ensemble of processors that were evenly distributed around a globe. My discovery of the first supercomputing across the world's lowest 
com across the world's slowest computers occurred at 15 minutes after 8 o'clock in the morning of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered that two raised to power 16 or 65,536 processors or as many electronic computers that were uniformly distributed around the hypersurface of a globe in a 16-dimensional hyperspace can be deployed to uniformly compute more accurate climate models around a globe. That is, I discovered that a multitude of ordinary processors could be used to foresee otherwise unforeseeable long-term global warming. In Google searching for quote-unquote father of the internet, the first name that suggested is Philip Emanuele. My signature discovery that made the news headlines in 1989 was my experimental confirmation of my 1974 paradigm of the world's fastest computing executed around a new internet. That's a new global network of 65,536 or two raised to power 16 of the shelf processors. I visualized my processors as uniformly distributed around a 16 dimensional globe that's embedded inside a 16 dimensional hyperspace. In the decade and a half that followed June 20, 1974, on a supercomputer that was at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, USA. I visualized my globe in the 16th extraordinary dimension rather than in the third ordinary dimension. We need to change the way we look at the internet. In my new paradigm, of the world's fastest computing executed around a new internet that uniformly encircles a globe in the 16th dimension. I visualize my 65,536 processors as two raised to power 16 processors in which each processor was directly connected to its 16 nearest neighboring processors. Those processors shared nothing and each operated its operating system. As the first mathematician to program an ensemble of 65,536 processors and use them to solve one of the most difficult problems in mathematics and physics, my grand challenge was to figure out how to marry millions or billions of ordinary processors together and marry them as one seamless, coherent, and gigantic supercomputer and marry them together by their 16 times to raise to power 16 or 1,048,576 or 1 binary million email wires. I used emails to send and receive intermediate answers to my testbed physics inspired problem. My testbed problem was an initial boundary value problem of mathematical and computational physics that was governed by a system of partial differential equations beyond the frontier of calculus and fluid dynamics. I'm the first computer, I'm the first supercomputer scientist as it's known today. As the first pilot to quote unquote, fly the world's fastest computer that was powered by 64 binary thousand processors. I asked the traffic guys, to show me lights from the ground. Realizing that I was black and African, they turned off all the lights. Fortunately, I was an instrument rated pilot who could land airplanes blindfolded. In the 1980s, I programmed a new global network of 65,536 coupled processors, which powered a new supercomputer that I defined as a new internet. I programmed my processors blindfolded. In the 1980s, I was the remote programmer of 16 
of the most massively parallel supercomputers in the world. I was logged into supercomputers 24-7 for parallel programming. I was known as the go-to person within the supercomputing community that include from the supercomputer centers in San Francisco, California, to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to Chicago, Illinois, to Cambridge, Massachusetts, to Washington, District of Columbia. However, supercomputer scientists in those centers who knew me by name only assumed that Philip M. Aguale was a white supercomputer scientist with an Eastern European last name. My contribution of parallel processing changed the way we look at supercomputers. For me, the emerging paradigm of fastest computing across a new internet that is described as the Philip M. Aguale Internet. I visualize my new internet as a new global network of processors. In my mathematical theory, my globe was embedded within my 16-dimensional hyperspace, but in my world's fastest computing, my globe in hyperspace was quote-unquote etched onto the three-dimensional space. I was in the news for experimentally discovering how to compute and communicate across my new internet. My internet surrounded a metaphorical globe in the 16th dimension and did so just as the internet circumscribes the earth in the third dimension. I was in the news because I theoretically and experimentally discovered how to make fastest computing across slowest processors useful and harness it to solve everyday problems, such as your evening weather forecast or foreseeing the spread of COVID-19. My discovery of the world's fastest computing remained my signature contribution to mathematics, physics, and computer science. I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974, at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, USA. In December 1965, that supercomputer in Covalis was rated as the world's fastest computer. I was programming a supercomputer that was faster than the one that helped put a man on the moon back on July 20, 1969. Because I was black and African, I was forced to work full time and alone on my research on how to combine computers into supercomputers and did so for 17 years and without any payment that was in proportion to what American billionaires were paid. After working full time and without pay for those 17 years, I felt like that keeping the entire credit for my invention is the only reward that I can have. It was like Chinua Achebe, who is the father of African literature, forgoing his auto royalties, but insisting that he alone be credited as the author of Things Fall Apart. And it was like Fela Kuti, forgoing his songwriting royalties, but insisting that he is the father of Afrobeat. I'm the father of the world's fastest computing as it's known today. And I'm the only father of the internet that invented a new internet. A question in school essays is this. What was Philip Emma Aguale's education like? I was born on August 23, 1954 in Akure in the western region of the British West African colony of Nigeria. In January 1960 and at age 5, I enrolled in first grade in St. Patrick's Primary School, Sapele, Nigeria. Several students in my class were twice my age, 
my seventh grade school photos that I posted on my website revealed that some of my classmates were twice my age. From January 1960 to March 1974, I attended on and off six schools within Nigeria, but I dropped out of school for five of those 14 years. I'm often invited to alumni reunions and remembered as the school's most gifted student. For that reason, my former school classmates were not surprised when I told them that I won a scholarship to the USA. My scholarship took effect on September 10, 1973. After a six month delay, I arrived in 36 Butler Hall, Monmouth, Oregon, and on the evening of Sunday, March 24, 1974. Twelve hours after my arrival, I had a conference with a brilliant American mathematician named Beryl M. Green. My goal was to become a mathematician, and Beryl M. Green was assigned as my mentor. To my surprise, we couldn't understand what each other was saying. At that time, I could only understand the spoken Nigerian and British English, and Beryl M. Green could only understand the spoken American English. In retrospect, I should have anticipated my difficulty, but I did not. Looking back to the early 1970s, there were no television in the southeastern region of Nigeria, where I then lived. The first time I listened intently to the spoken American was in about May 1973. And during the listening portion of the American TOEFL, the acronym for Test of English as a Foreign Language, I took TOEFL at the Hope Wardle Training Institution, Calabar, Nigeria. Not surprising, I failed the listening portion of TOEFL. In the early 1970s, Nigerians arriving in the USA for the first time could not understand the spoken American English. It took me several weeks to understand the American English. So on my first day in the USA, I wasn't sure what language the mathematician, Beryl M. Green, was speaking. And he felt the same way about me. For several minutes, we stared, we stared at each other and looked confused. To introduce myself, I grabbed a chalk from his desk, walked to his blackboard, and scribbled a difficult problem, mathematics problem that pertained to number theory. I derived its solution. That impressed him. He said that I should go far in the field of mathematics. The following day, Beryl M. Green secured a second scholarship for me. He advised me to transfer 20 miles away from Monmouth to Covalis, Oregon. That was how I came to Kida Hall, Covalis, a building that housed the most brilliant mathematicians in Oregon. Directly opposite from Kida Hall was the building that housed the only supercomputer in Oregon. Three months later, I began supercomputing. Back in 1970, in Christ the King College, Onitsha, I was well known, but only known by my nickname, Calculus, not by my birth name, Philip M. Agwale. Calculus is the powerful technique that must be used to solve the most difficult problems in physics. Such grand challenge problems include the computational fluid dynamics models that are used to determine the best social distancing measures that will reduce the spread of the coronavirus disease. Fast forward 20 years into the USA, I was in the news as the mathematician who contributed to calculus. Outside Nigeria, I attended six universities, with each one claiming me as its notable alumnus. The last university that I attended has 610 
thousand living alumni, whom it sends a quarterly update on the best minds on the university campus. The February 1991 issue of Michigan Today was a tribute issue by the University of Michigan on its most renowned scientist named Philip Emma Aguale and his contributions to the world's fastest computing. So I won early acclaim for my contributions to supercomputing and did so across the length and breadth of the state of Michigan. At that time, it was very offensive to white scientific communities for a white American university to glorify a black sub-Saharan African as smarter than Albert Einstein. For that reason, only the portraits of white male scientists were allowed to be exhibited on their wall of genesis. In 1989, I was the first scientist, black or white, to be described as smarter than Albert Einstein. I became an intellectual threat that must be suppressed at all costs. I was controversial because I did not meet the whiteness criterion that was the requirement to be called a genius. To this day, the university upholds its tradition of only naming buildings after obscure white male scientists, as well as only displaying the portraits of, of, of obscure white historical figures and displaying them with the intent to lower the self-esteem of its underrepresented students. What's a day in Biafra like? A question in school essays is this. List three interesting events in the life of Philip Emma Aguale. I dropped out of school for five years, between ages 12 to 19. I dropped out to live in refugee camps of Biafra of the Nigerian Civil War. One in 15 Biafrans died during that 30 month long war. In the list of the worst genocidal crimes of the 20th century that were committed against humanity, the death of one in 15 Biafrans was ranked fifth when the Nigerian Civil War began. My father's residential address was at 4B Ebunadazia Street, or that Onicha Biafra. In late 1967, the Fege and Odaapo quarters of Onicha were deserted except for full time looters and trophy hunters. After the attack of October 12, 1967, and during the five and a half months that preceded March 20, 1968, downtown Onitsha became a ghost town. At that time, its downtown wasn't a safe place to visit alone. On March 20, 1968, Refugees living in Enua nature, called in Town, noticed the sudden influx of thousands of frightened Biafran soldiers. Some of those Biafran soldiers confided to their refugee relatives in Enua nature that they were fleeing from the nearby Abagana battlefield. Those Biafran soldiers were fleeing beyond nature and towards Oba and Newi. Unknown to us, namely the Biafran refugees in Onitsha, was that the Biafran soldiers who should protect us were routed by the Nigerian army and we are disorganized. Biafran soldiers defending Onitsha fled hastily and fled without alerting us the 15,000 refugees in Enu Onitsha to join them in their flight to safety. During that 30-month-long war, 
both the Nigerians and Biafrans killed their civilian captives and their war prisoners. That was one reason one in 15 Biafrans died in 30 months. In 1968, and at the war front inside Biafra, Colonel Benjamin Adekunle, also known as Black Scorpion, who led the Third Marine Commando, told a French radio reporter, and I quote, we shoot at everything that moves. And when our troops march into the center of Igbo territory, we shoot at everything, even at things that do not move. End of quote. Unknown to the 15,000 refugees who sought their safety in the Enwanisha, thousands of Nigerian soldiers were rapidly thundering from Abagana to Anicha. The Nigerian army had superior firepower while the Biafran soldiers had run out of bullets and were rapidly retreating from the Abagana war front. One of the dark secrets of the Nigerian Civil War was this. On March 20, 1968, the Biafran army used the 15,000 refugees in Onitsha as their human shields. The, fleeing, the Biafran soldiers fleeing from Onitsha had ample time to evacuate those refugees. The Biafran government used those 15,000 refugees who were Onitsha indigents as its human shield. The Biafran government capitalized on the certain deaths of refugees and tendered them as proof of Nigerian genocide against Igbos. Six months earlier, we were refugees at 6 C. Wilkinson Road on Echa. That address was next to Obiokosi Primary School. That school was closed and converted as, a military as the military barrack of 1,000 Biafran soldiers. The invading Nigerian army considered that Biafra military barrack and by extension our homes that we are next to, that we are next to that barrack, to be their legitimate military target number one. And in early and in the early morning of October 12, 1967, and as a 13 year old, I was fleeing along Wilkinson Road on Icha carrying a heavily loaded tin pan on my head. After fleeing with my mother and six siblings, and fleeing towards Ogidi, that was seven miles away. As I turned right into Wilkinson Road, towards Ogidi, I looked to my left, towards Metropolitan College, and saw what seemed to be a house-to-house -house combat. I saw a Biafran soldier crouching with his Satima gun, firing towards Metropolitan College. Unknown to us, the Nigerian army was attempting to capture the Biafran military barrack that was headquartered at Obiokosi Primary School of Umar Sele, water of Edwanicha. That was a shouting distance from our residence at 6 C Wilkinson Road on Echa. As we continued our flight, and a few seconds later, a bullet casing fell two feet in front of me and on the then untied Wilkinson Road. Another minute later, I saw two Biafran soldiers, whom 10 minutes earlier, I saw hiding in the bush behind our house at 6 C Wilkinson Road. I saw those two soldiers remove their Biafran army uniform and change into civilian clothes. Like a thousand Biafran soldiers did that early morning, those, early, those two soldiers fled because 
the better armed Nigerian army had attacked their military barrack. Looking back retrospectively, the Nigerian army implicitly gave the civilians whom were living in Enua nature eight days for warning to flee from Enua nature. Those were the eight days of continuous artillery shelling of our nature that originated from the banks of the River Niger at Asaba. The Biafran army had eight days to evacuate refugees from the inland town quarter of our nature called Enua nature to safer villages such as Ogidi or Newi. Instead of evacuating the refugees from the Onicha war front, the Biafran army used those 15,000 Indian Onicha refugees as their human shields. Those 15,000 human shields included my 28-year-old mother, myself, and my six siblings of ages 1 to 11. We were among the 15,000 refugees who fled back, who fled back on October 4, 1967, from the Fege and Odabo quarters of downtown Onitsha to Enua Onitsha inland quarters. Enua Onitsha was beyond the artillery reach of the Nigerian army and was therefore safer. Enua Onitsha was farthest from the west bank of the river Niger at Asaba. That West Bank at Asaba was where the rockets of the Nigerian army that were under the guidance of Colonel Moitola Mohammed, the future president of Nigeria, were fired with reckless abandon and fired upon the Fege and other quarters of downtown Onitsha. During those eight days that followed October 4, 1967, of continuous shelling, the Biafran army didn't evacuate the 15,000 refugees who sought shelter in any nature that was the inland town quarter of our nature. The Biafran army used those 15,000 refugees as their human shields and their protection against the steadily advancing Nigerian army that outmanned and outgunned them by four to one. Throughout that 30-month-long war, in which one in 15 Biafrans died, the Nigerian army controlled the Biafran airspace and enforced a complete sea blockade of Biafra. After the war was over, I started nursing the ambition to come to the USA. I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974, in Kowalis, Oregon. How are supercomputers used in Venezuela? In an email, a 15-year-old writing the biography of a famous computer scientist and his contributions to the development of the computer asked me, how are supercomputers used in Venezuela? The supercomputer market is valued at $45 billion a year. The energy and geoscience industries buy one in 10 supercomputers and use them to pinpoint oil deposits. The Bolivar coastal oil field of Venezuela contains 32 billion barrels of recoverable oil reserves. The Bolivar coastal oil field stretches across 35 miles along the coast of, coast of Lake Maracaibo of Venezuela. Fastest computing that's executed across millions of processors is the key technology that must be used to pinpoint deposits of crude oil in the Bolivar coastal oil field. In 1989, I was in the news for discovering how the slowest processors in the world could be harnessed as the world's fastest computer and used to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas. 
on June 20, 1974, in Corvallis, Oregon, I began programming one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. That was when I began my quest for the fastest computation ever that could be harnessed and used to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and physics. As I grew in my knowledge, I wanted to invent my fastest supercomputing as a new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 processors, which collectively is 64 binary thousand times faster than the fastest computer that's sequentially processing with one processor. I discovered the fastest supercomputer, not as a computer in and of itself, but as a virtual supercomputer that's defined across a globe which hosts a new global network of processors that shared nothing, but we are in dialogue with each other. I recorded the fastest speeds in computing without the supercomputer as it was then known. I visualized my new internet in the 16th dimensional hyperspace and I visualized that globe to be encircled by two raised to power 16 or 65,536 processors with each processor akin to a tiny computer. I visualized those tiny computers to be uniformly distributed across that globe or separated equal distances apart. I could discover but not create the fastest computation across my new internet. I can only discover a faster computation if and only if that computation pre-exists across my new internet. And I can only invent techniques and technologies that can be invented or that the laws of physics allow me to invent. The fastest computer that yielded a quantum increase in speed led to the creation of the field of computational physics. The fastest computing across the slowest processors that I discovered on the 4th of July, 1989, gave birth to extreme scaled, high resolution computational physics. That discovery of the world's fastest computing is my contribution to physics. I'm well known, but I'm not known well. A teacher asked her students, why is Philip Emma Aguale famous? I'm well known because I knew a new arithmetic that no teacher knew. Before my discovery of that new arithmetic, which occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, teachers could only teach how to perform the fastest multiplications and divisions, and how to execute them on a computer that was powered by one processor. After my discovery of parallel processing, teachers could now teach how to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and solve them at the world's fastest speeds and across the Philip Emma Aguale computer. That's not a computer in and of itself, but that's a new internet in reality. Each discovery or invention we make contributes to human civilization. Our technological quest for the fastest computations across a new internet is our search for human progress. To invent a new computer is to turn science fiction to reality. A science fiction writer can be a storyteller who solved the most difficult problem in mathematics and solved it by merely waving his pen 
and declaring the impossible to solve. It's now possible to solve. In contrast, a computational mathematician can't solve the toughest initial boundary value problems at the frontiers of calculus, compute intensive algebra or extreme scale computational fluid dynamics, and solve such physics problems by merely waving his or her hand. As a high performance computational mathematician, I can only discover the discrete solution to the toughest problem beyond the frontier of calculus and only discover that solution if and only if such a solution exists but was not understood. I can only invent things which are possible to invent. A science fiction writer can write about cars that run only on water but, not, but which are not possible to invent. In contrast, a scientist must develop a prototype of at least one car that he claims only runs on water. It's possible for a science fiction writer to write 100 science fiction books. In contrast, it's impossible for a supercomputer scientist to make two groundbreaking discoveries in his lifetime. It's impossible for one inventor to invent the world's fastest computer that computes in parallel and then later invent the hoped for quantum supercomputer which wrangles subatomic particles to encode information as quantum bits or qubits that exist in superposition. The inventions of parallel and quantum supercomputers demands radical ideas, billions of dollars, and decades of hard work. The parallel and quantum supercomputers are each paradigm shifting, and each technology change the way we look at the computer of tomorrow. Nature does not give up its secrets without a fight. What are my contributions to the invention of the fastest computers? What did Philip Emma Aguale contribute to the development of the computer? To parallel process, the most difficult problem in mathematics is to solve many less challenging problems at once. The technique of computing many things at once was known to the census board that used thousands of human computers to execute billions of arithmetic computations. My contribution to computer science was my discovery that the world's fastest computer could be powered by 64 binary thousand processors. Each processor was akin to a tiny computer that can be used to solve many compute intensive problems and solve them at once. In 1989, my discovery of fastest computing made the news headlines and did so because it opened the door to the use of up to 1 billion processors to power the world's fastest computer. I visualized my new internet as my new spherical island of 64 binary thousand processors, or as a new global network of as many tiny computers. I visualized that new internet as tightly encircling my room size globe. Not only that, I visualized my new internet as to raise to power 16 or 65,536 processors that we are identical and that we are uniformly distributed around the surface of a globe. Likewise, I visualize that hypersurface in a 16-dimensional hyperspace. My visualization of my new internet 
was new. Therefore, the word internet wasn't in my vocabulary in the, the mid-1970s. I coined the term hyperbolic computer to describe my new global network of computers and processors, which I theorized. That hyperbolic computer was renamed as Philip Emma Aguale computer. My theory, which I physicalized as the fastest computer, was my mental recreation of a new internet as a new supercomputer that was powered by a new global network of 65,536 processors that shared nothing. How did I win the Nobel Prize of supercomputing back in 1989? In 1989, the Computer Society of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE, issued a press release that I achieved a technological breakthrough. And did so by discovering the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. That IEEE press release had an impact because the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers was the world's largest technical society. In the May 1990 issue of the academic journal named Software, the Computer Society of IEEE described the economic benefits of my scientific discovery of fastest computing and described it as, quote, the amount of money at stake it's staggering. For example, you can typically expect to recover 10% of the field's oil. The Computer Society of IEEE continued. If you can improve your production schedule to get just 1% more oil, you will increase your yield by $400 million. End of quote. That 1989 press release issued by the Computer Society that announced my technological breakthrough and scientific discovery of the world's fastest computing and the companion articles published by the Computer Society in IEEE publications led to cover stories in, my, in many trade publications and led to front page stories that were titled African Supercomputer Genius Wins Top U.S. prize. And that 1989 press release issued by the Computer Society led to stories of my contributions to mathematics, physics, and computer science. I discovered that the fastest computer can be built with the slowest processors. I discovered how and why using a thousand processors makes modern computers faster and makes the newest supercomputer the fastest. On July 4, 1989, the US Independence Day in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, I discovered the Philip M. R. Guale formula for the world's fastest computing that later US President, that later US President Bill Clinton will describe in his White House speech of August 26, 2000. My technological breakthrough opened the door to the world's fastest computer that must be used to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and solve such problems at the fastest speeds ever recorded. I visualized my scientific discovery of the world's fastest calculations, calculations as occurring across a new internet Likewise, I visualized my new internet as defined as a new global network of 65,536 off-the-shelf processors and standard parts. Furthermore, I invented how to use my new internet to send and receive emails and do both at the fastest bandwidth ever recorded. I invented 
how to parallel program my new internet. I visualize that new internet as a new global network of 65,536 or 64 binary thousand tiny identical computers. I theorized how to harness those processors and use them to communicate across another new global network of 1,048,576 or 1 binary million regular and short email wires that were equal distances apart. Not only that, I mathematically and experimentally invented how to solve 64 binary thousand initial boundary value problems that arise beyond the frontier of calculus and computational physics. I invented how to solve them at once and how to email and solve them across a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors that define my new internet and how to reduce 65,000 536 days or 180 years of time to solution within one processor and reduce that computation time to one day of time to solution across my new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 off-the-shelf processors that are identical, that shared nothing, and that's a supercomputer de facto. I'm the only father of the internet that invented an internet. A question asked in school essays is this. Why is Philip Emma Aguale famous? Before my discovery that occurred on July 4, 1989, it was believed to be impossible to achieve the world's fastest computing, and do so across the world's slowest processors. It made the news headlines when I discovered that the unimaginable to compute is possible to supercompute. However, understanding how I made the unimaginable possible wasn't what made the news headlines in 1989. What made the news headlines was that I did the then impossible. Namely, I discovered how to turn a vague idea, a mere theory, and a science fiction that was published on February 1, 1922, into reality. That science fiction was about 64,000 human computers forecasting the weather around the globe on the 4th of July, 1989, I discovered how 64 binary thousand processors can be used to execute a global climate model. Such high-stake climate models are used to foresee otherwise unforeseeable global warming. I discovered how to turn that science fiction of 1922 to the non-fiction of 1989 that's now known as the world's fastest computing. In the traditional way of manufacturing supercomputers, one powerful processor is connected to one memory. That super fast processor executes one instruction at a time. In my alternative way of inventing supercomputers, I made the news headlines when I discovered that parallel processing is up to a billion times faster. I discovered the world's fastest computing on the 4th of July, 1989. I discovered supercomputing as it's executed today or how to compute at the fastest speeds and do so across my ensemble of, 60, of the 64 binary thousand slowest processors in the world, I discovered the world's fastest computing on July 4, 1989. I discovered parallel processing. By dividing a compute-intensive discrete and algebraic approximation of an initial boundary value problem of calculus and physics, ranging from a global climate model to modeling the social distancing 
that reduces the spread of the coronavirus disease within Nigerian buses that pack passengers like sardines. I chopped up each compute intensive problem into lesser challenging problems. Finally, I assigned one processor to solve one less compute intensive mathematical physics problem. Furthermore, I discovered the one problem to one processor correspondence, which I used to solve the 64 binary thousand mathematical problems that in totality are important societal problems. The list of 20 most compute intensive or grand challenge problems includes detailed climate modeling that must be executed with the fastest speed and accuracy. I discovered how to harness my 64 binary thousand processors, which I used to de facto synchronously solve my two raised to power 16, 16 initial boundary value problems that I solved at once. My invention of how to execute the fastest computing can be extended to a billion processors which encircle an internet or a globe and did so as one seamless, coherent, and gigantic supercomputer. In 1989, it made the news headlines that a Nigerian supercomputer genius in the USA had recorded the fastest speed in the history of computing, and recorded that speed across the slowest processors in the world, and recorded that speed while solving the most compute intensive problems in the world. And that Nigerian supercomputer scientist that was in the news. On the 4th of July, 1989, I recorded the highest speed up and the fastest speed in supercomputing. That scientific discovery led to my conclusion that fastest computing across a billion processors will become the technology that can yield a factor of one billion fold reduction in the world clock times for solving the most difficult problems in mathematics and physics. That includes global climate models used to foresee otherwise unforeseeable long-term global warming. The most powerful supercomputers are used to address some of the world's biggest challenges. I'm a Nigerian-born computer scientist who came of age in the USA of the 1970s and 80s. In the 1980s, the most compelling mathematical puzzles and questions that faced high-performance computer scientists were these. What's the speed limit in computing? Or what's the best way to build the world's fastest computer? Can the world's fastest computer ever fit in a room? Can the most difficult problems in mathematics be solved across an ensemble of one billion processors that outline an internet? How do we invent a never before seen computer? Can a billion processors work together to emulate a supercomputer? It's easier to ask these questions than to provide their answers. But the, world, but the world worships any inventor who can answer the most difficult questions at the crossroad where new computational mathematics, new computational physics, and the world's fastest computing intersect. A school essay question is this. What is the contribution of Philip M. Aguale to the development of the computer? I discovered the world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors and discovered how to use the fastest computers to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics. I made those discoveries on the 4th of July, 1989. My new computer science opened the door to the world's fastest computer that now occupies the footprint of a football field. The fastest computer 
is powered by millions of processors. Before my supercomputing discovery, the idea of the fastest computing across the slowest processors was merely a theory or an idea that's not positively true. My contribution to the development of the world's fastest computers is this. I discovered that a billion self-contained processors that we are locked together can be programmed to emulate one seamless coherent machinery that's a supercomputer in reality. My discovery is the origin of the first supercomputer. Becoming a famous computer scientist doesn't happen the way you see them in the movies. I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974 in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. Back in 1974, I was not hailed as a supercomputer genius. The reason was that the world waited for 15 years for me to provide the hard evidence that the world's slowest processors can power the world's fastest computer. At 8.15 in the morning, or in the morning on July 4, 1989, I discovered that using a billion processors to power a supercomputer is useful and doable. School essays on the contributions of Philip M. Aguale to computer science highlight the invention of how to harness the slowest processors to perform the fastest computing. That invention is central to the first supercomputer as it's known today and as it's expected to be known tomorrow. The reason my invention made the news headlines in 1989 was because it heralded the end of the era of vector supercomputers that was powered by only one isolated vector processing unit. Inventing the world's fastest computer demands programming millions of processors, not interacting with thousands of people. As a black supercomputer inventor, in the United States of the 1970s and 80s, I discovered the world's fastest computing and did so alone, as well as independently of any institution. In the 1970s and 80s, I was a black inventor that was trapped within all white spaces. In the 1970s and in the USA, the most brilliant sub-Saharan African scientists were not allowed to teach research and even present their inventions to the public and compete on the same terms as white scientists. I was the first person to perform the world's fastest computing and do so via parallel processing. Because I was black, I was not allowed to teach research and even present my world's fastest computing to the public. In a perverse twist, as computers become faster, the more reliant on parallel computing they become. And parallel computing became synonymous with computer science. Parallel computing is ubiquitous at the frontier of knowledge of the most difficult problems that arise in science, engineering, and medicine. In the early 1980s, my world's fastest computing was rejected when I first presented the technology to universities in the USA. In the mid-1980s, my theorized fastest computing across a new global network of 65,536 processors was rejected in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It was rejected because a black inventor invented it. In 1989, and after I won the highest award in supercomputing, 
I received invitations to give lectures on the world's fastest computer and to give those lectures at a time I was the only person in the world that could deliver such lectures. It should not come as a surprise that on YouTube I delivered the most lectures on contributions to mathematics, physics, and computer science. What surprised me in 1989 was that I was often disinvited from giving lectures on the world's fastest computing, even though I was the first supercomputer scientist that came to mind when thinking about how to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and solve them on the fastest computer that's powered by millions of processors. The disparate treatment was this. A white computer scientist who could only teach the old sequential computing paradigm was hired over the black supercomputer scientist who discovered the new paradigm of supercomputing across a billion processors. Because of the institutionalized racial discrimination in the USA, I became well known, but not known well. Racism is a dangerous cancer of the mind. Not allowing the black mathematician to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics slows down human progress and does so by excluding geniuses from contributing to knowledge. The irony was that those white supremacists who disinvited me from giving research lectures on my contributions to developing the fastest computers now complained that they couldn't understand the complicated mathematics and the advanced computer science that we are behind the invention that I made in the 1970s and 80s. I described my inventions across the 1,000 closed caption videos that I posted on my YouTube channel named Emma Aguale. I've been supercomputing since June 20, 1974 in Cavalis, Oregon, USA. After half a century of supercomputing, a huge knowledge gap developed between those that rejected my computer science, my new computer science, and myself. That knowledge gap manifested itself in their inability to replicate my world's fastest computer speeds of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. That knowledge gap is visible after watching the 1,000 Close caption videos of my lectures, which I shared on YouTube, and then comparing them to the videotape lectures of the leading minds in mathematics, physics, and computer science. The misperception of some white supremacists that Albert Einstein, who is considered the father of modern physics, knows more about computational physics than I do, differed from the reality that I was the only single person to ever record the world's fastest computation. On YouTube, I said much in a thousand videos about the first supercomputer as it's known today. And I did so because I was the first inventor to understand that the new, that the new computer science becomes the world's fastest if and only if it's powered by up to 1 billion processors. I discovered the breakthrough that changed the way we look at computers. In the old way of solving the most difficult problems in mathematics, the fastest computation was achieved by solving one initial boundary value problem of physics. Such mathematical problems arise in multi-scale modeling of biological system, as well as the large-scale computational fluid dynamics model that must be used to foresee 
how the coronavirus disease spreads across the densely packed on each market where social distancing is not enforced. In the old mathematics textbooks, only one such prob problem was solved at a time and within one processor. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered a new billion processor paradigm that was a faster way of solving the most difficult problems in mathematics. My new mathematics yields the first world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors. In my new supercomputing paradigm, I changed the way I looked at the world's fastest computer. I discovered how to perform the world's fastest computations and solve the most compute-intensive mathematical problems in computational physics. And I invented how to solve them across an ensemble of a billion coupled processors that shared nothing and solved them billions of times faster than in the conventional paradigm of solving one problem at a time. I achieved that mathematical breakthrough of solving 65,536 initial boundary value problems, each governed by a system of partial differential equations, and solving them at once and across as many processors that were evenly distributed across a globe. The initial boundary value problem that's governed by a system of partial differential equations is the most useful subject in mathematics. But to be useful, these grand challenge problems must be solved across an ensemble of up to 1 billion processors. I was the first person to discover how to solve partial differential equations and do so across up to 1 billion processors and solve them at the fastest computing speeds. That paradigm shift in high performance computing or change in the way we look at the world's fastest computer went against the prevailing dogma prior to my supercomputer discovery that occurred on July 4, 1989. Computer scientists believe that it will be fastest to solve only one compute-intensive problem at a time instead of solving up to one billion problems at once. That supercomputing dogma of solving one problem at a time and solving it on one powerful processor was encoded in Amdahl's law. Physics is the king of sciences, and mathematics is the queen of sciences. Computer science is not a science in and of itself. Computer science is a science of sciences. The invention of the world's fastest computing that works differently from regular computers, creates new sciences. In science, it was not enough for me to say that a billion processors could be used to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics. I had to provide the hard evidence that my theory was true. On July 4, 1989, I experimentally proved my discovery to be true. Furthermore, I provided the complete explanations of how I made my supercomputing discovery. I did so across the 1,000 videos that I posted on in my YouTube channel named Emma Aguale. Amdahl's law was to the supercomputer what Moore's law is to the computer and what the second law of motion is to physics. Amdahl's law decreed that a speed increase of a factor of 8 
would be impossible to attain across eight or more processors. I was in the news because I discovered that that supercomputer textbooks that quoted Amda's law we are wrong. I proved computer science textbooks wrong when I discovered how to use my new global network of the slowest 65,536 processors in the world to execute the fastest computer calculations and solve the most difficult problems that arise in mathematics, science, and medicine. The poster girl of difficult problems in mathematics was extreme-scale computational fluid dynamics such as high-stake petroleum reservoir simulations that must be used to nail down the exact locations of crude oil and natural gas that are buried up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and buried across an oil-producing field that's the size of a town. I used my 65,536 processors to perform the arithmetic operations from the system of equations of computational linear algebra, from my finite difference discretizations of a system of partial differential equations beyond the frontier of calculus. I invented nine partial differential equations called the Philip M. Aguale equations. And I invented them by encoding the second law of motion described in physics textbooks into them. The Philip M. Aguale equations govern the motions of crude oil and natural gas that flow across a highly anisotropic and heterogeneous producing oil field that's up to twice the size of the state of Anambra, Nigeria. Amdahl's law claims that an ensemble of a billion processors couldn't be harnessed and used to solve initial boundary value problems of computational fluid dynamics and solve them with the hoped for speed increase of a factor of one billion. I discovered that Amdahl's law was a false theory and an enormous lie that was spread around via computer science textbooks. By its definition, a theory is not positively true. In the 1980s, I was the only full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputer ever built. I discovered how to compute at the fastest speeds and compute while solving the toughest mathematical problems and compute across a new internet. I visualized my new internet as a new global network of 65,536 off-the-shelf processors and standard parts. Those processors were identical, coupled, and equal distances apart. So I was the first person to understand the new supercomputing as fastest computing across a million processors. I'm not a science teacher of known facts in textbooks. The 1,000 closed captioned videos that I shared on YouTube were my first person accounts from the unexplored territories of knowledge. My lectures were stories about new partial differential equations called the nine Philip Emma Aguali equations beyond the frontier of calculus. Until I discovered them, those equations had not been written in any calculus textbook. My invention was how the world's fastest computer can be built from the world's slowest processors. My discovery, which occurred on July 4, 1989, made the news headlines because it was new knowledge that changed the way mathematicians solve their most difficult problems. Until my discovery, the fastest computer speed had not been recorded by a one-person team or recorded across the slowest processors in the world. So my lectures across 
the 1000 podcast and closed caption videos which I posted on YouTube were first person stories from the frontiers of supercomputing. My lectures were first drafts of the history of supercomputing and computational mathematics. I understood that new supercomputer as a radical shift that will change the way we look at the modern computer. That was the reason my discovery of fastest computing made the news headlines. That headline was that a lone African supercomputer genius in the USA had won the highest award in supercomputing and won it for discovering how to harness the 64 binary thousand slowest processors in the world and for discovering how to use those processors to solve the most difficult problems arising in mathematics and physics and solve them at the fastest speeds in computing. Because I was the first person to make that super computing discovery, my name, Philip Emma Aguale, comes up first in YouTube and for such terms like contributions to mathematics, physics, and computer science. My contributions to mathematics were these. I invented the system of nine Philip M. Aguil equations, each a partial differential equation. My system of equations is a new mathematical tool used to pinpoint the locations of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that flow up to 7.7 .7 miles underneath the earth. And I invented how to solve the corresponding initial boundary value problem and solve it across up to a billion processors that outline and define an internet. My new mathematical knowledge expanded the ever-growing body of knowledge that's known as calculus. It's an absurd oversimplification to claim that calculus was co-invented 330 years ago by Isaac Newton and Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz. This claim is erroneously repeated in calculus textbooks and by its teachers. Newton and Leibniz contributed to calculus but did not invent the subject. The development of calculus is the product of centuries-long evolution. Recent contributions to calculus include the nine partial differential equations that I invented and my discovery that initial boundary value problems governed by a system of partial differential equations can be solved across an internet that's a global network of up to a billion processors. My contribution to mathematics was in the top mathematics publications in the world, including being mentioned in the July 1990 issue of the notices of the American, American Mathematical Society. In 1989, I discovered how to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and physics. I made my discovery on a new supercomputer that's powered by a global network of up to 1 billion processors. My processors outline and define my new internet. That new knowledge that I contributed to modern science and technology include nine partial differential equations. The Philip M. Aguali equations were my contributions to the existing body of mathematical knowledge. I was a research physicist who came of age in the 1970s and 80s and first won a claim in 1989. I discovered how to use the laws of physics to gain a deeper and surer mathematical understanding of how to model multi-phase flows of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that were flowing up to 7.7 .7 miles deep and inside a production oil field that's the size of a town. Furthermore, I was an inventor 
who invented a new supercomputer that's a new internet not only that i forced these those three identities to emerge within me and find a common but never before seen technology i visualized my invention as a high performance communicating and computing machinery and as a new supercomputer that's not a new computer by and itself but that's a new internet by definition i was treated differently after my discovery of the first supercomputing across the world's lowest processors my invention occurred in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, and it occurred on the 4th of July, 1989. After the news headlines that followed that invention, the stories chased me rather than me chasing the stories. And the hummingbirds flew towards me rather than me running towards the hummingbirds. I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974, in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. In 1974, few blacks were allowed entry into supercomputer learning, learning and research centers. Twelve years earlier, a black student, James Meredith, fought to integrate the University of Mississippi without access to education. The likes of James Meredith cannot become supercomputer scientists. That was why I never met a black supercomputer scientist during the 1970s and 80s. And that was why everyone was shocked when a black person won the highest award that computer scientists describe as the Nobel Prize of supercomputing. I won that prize alone back in 1989. My discovery of the world's fastest computing was a record-breaking and sustained performance. It was recorded in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. I was in the news on the day Nelson Mandela was released from prison, but I was boycotted in the manner South Africa was boycotted for apartheid. That boycott was significant because in schools, the bearer of new knowledge or scientific discoveries transmits it through the spoken word. A scholar without lectures on YouTube is like radio without sound or a movie without images. Those early boycotts of my lectures of the 1980s we are the scientific equivalent of mainstream radio stations working together to keep black music off the air. In the field of supercomputing of the 1980s, most of the 25,000 paid pos positions were reserved for white males. I gave hiring lectures for some of those paid positions. After each hiring lecture, the supercomputing position was closed. When it comes to racial diversity in American academia, the fields of mathematics, physics, and computer science are half a century behind, behind society. The racial diversity in the supercomputing world of the 1970s and 80s, the two decades during which I came of age, was like the racial diversity in U.S. mainstream radio broadcasting of the 1920s and 30s. In the 1940s and 50s, African-American entertainers were forced to use a different door to enter white radio stations. In the 1970s and 80s, my access to supercomputers were withdrawn after it was discovered that I was black and sub-Saharan African. A school essay question is this. Who is the father of supercomputing? Asking who is the father of supercomputing 
It's like asking who is the father of rock and roll. No one person started rock and roll. Notwithstanding, if two persons can claim the title of the father of rock and roll, there will be Little Richard and Chuck Berry. Elvis Presley will not be included because he didn't write his songs. Elvis Presley brought rock and roll to a larger audience and became the face of white rock and roll. Unlike Elvis Presley, the songs of Little Richard weren't played on mainstream radio stations. Instead, the covers of Little Richard's songs that were recorded by Pat Boone and the Beatles were played on white radio stations. And those covers became hit songs. Fast forward three decades from the 1950s. I discovered that white scientific communities weren't ready to hear my new presentations on fastest computing, just as mainstream radio stations didn't play black music. And white research scientists were paid millions of dollars to falsely claim the credit for inventing the Philip M. Aguale computer, which I invented half a century ago. When I began supercomputing on June 20, 1974, in Corvallis, Oregon, USA, dividing the most compute-intensive problems from large-scale geophysical fluid dynamics and dividing such difficult problems into a billion lesser challenging problems and then solving them across smaller problems, across an ensemble of one billion processors was science fiction. For those reasons, large-scale computational physicists and mathematicians we are frightened and fled from computing across processors. The June 14, 1976 issue of the Computer World magazine summed the difficulty up in an article that was titled, quote, Research in Parallel Processing, questioned as a waste of time, unquote. Vector supercomputer scientists fled from parallel computing because they believed it would be simply impossible to harness thousands of processors and use them to solve the most difficult problems at the frontiers of knowledge where new mathematics, new physics, and new computer science intersect. I was castigated, ostracized, and banished during my 15-year-long quest for the world's fastest computer, that quote-unquote new computer wasn't a computer in and of itself. It was a new internet in reality. I discovered my new internet, a new supercomputer, within the bowels of an ensemble of the 65,536 slowest processors in the world. At its core, I defined my world's fastest computing as occurring when one billion processors work together as one cohesive coherent unit that can be used to solve as many problems at once. Such less challenging problems arise from dividing up the most difficult problem in mathematics into one billion less difficult problems that are mapped with a one problem to one processor correspondence. Each processor operated its operating system and had its dedicated memory. In contrast and in symmetric multiprocessing, several processors share a single memory and share the same operating system. As a supercomputer scientist, I came of age in scalar supercomputing of mid-1974 in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. And in the first supercomputing across the world's lowest plus computers that I discovered on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. In the 1970s, parallel computing was mocked, ridiculed, and dismissed 
as a tremendous waste of everybody's time. It was then believed that one billion processors could only yield a maximum speed increase of a factor of two, and do so if and only if 50% of the compute intensive problem can be solved at once. That parallel process speed increase becomes a factor of 4, 10, and 20, and becomes so when 75%, 90%, and 95%, respectively, of the large scale computational fluid dynamics code could be solved at once. I was in the news in 1989 because I was the computational mathematician who discovered how to unlock Moore's law for one processor and discovered how to mathematically solve one billion problems at once and solve them across an ensemble of one billion processors. A question in school essays is this. What is the contribution of Philip Emma Aguale to mathematics? The first world's fastest computing across up to a billion processors that work together to solve the most compute intensive, the most difficult problems is my contribution to mathematics. My new knowledge must be used to address the biggest challenges that are governed by partial differential equations. Such equations occur at the frontiers of calculus, algebra, and physics. For example, a system of coupled nonlinear partial differential equations must be solved to deeply understand the spread of the coronavirus across the crowded Onitsha market of my country of birth, Nigeria. That's my contribution to large-scale computational mathematics. The modern calculus will not be useful without the supercomputer or without solving the most compute-intensive problems in calculus and solving them across an ensemble of millions of processors. The technique of parallel computing was to a large extent invented by computational mathematicians for computational physicists. After my discovery that the world's fastest computers can be built from standard parts called processors, parallel supercomputing made the vector supercomputer obsolete and reduced it to the technological equivalent of the horse and carriage that was replaced by the now obsolete steam engine. I discovered the fastest computing from the slowest processing. The obstacle that I overcame before I could discover the first world's fastest computing across the world's slowest processors was to become the first person to figure out how to use the slowest processors in the world and use them to solve the most compute intensive problems in the world. Those were the most difficult mathematical problems that must be solved across the millions of processors that outline and define the extremely fast supercomputer and solve them at the fastest possible speeds in the world. In the supercomputer textbooks of the 1980s, that obstacle was described as overcoming the bottleneck called Amdahl's law. In prose, Amdahl's law decreed that when capital P, number of processors, is used to solve a compute-intensive initial boundary value problem of calculus, such as those in large-scale computational fluid dynamics, and if the serial fraction of that grand challenge problem is lowercase f, then the expected increase in supercomputer speed will be 1 divided by the sum of lowercase f plus 1 minus lowercase f divided by capital P. The expected increase in parallel process speed across 
1 billion processors will only be as large as the weakest link will, per will permit. Computer scientists often think how I did, or computer scientists often ask, how did I uniquely name my 65,536 processors that I harnessed to execute the world's fastest computing of 1989? Because I invented new supercomputing, I had to come up with a new name for it and do so for the same reason. A newborn infant must have a new name. At various times in the 1980s, I named it a hyperball supercomputer. Then I shortened that name to a hypercomputer and it was finally, rena finally renamed the quote-unquote Philip Emma Aguale supercomputer. The Emma Aguale computer is a new global network of millions of processors or a small and physically realizable copy of the internet that's not a science fiction. Such idealized internets might not be visible around a globe, but will be intelligible to the supercomputer scientists. If necessity is the mother of invention, I say the most compute-intensive problems in science, engineering, and medicine necessitated the pushing of the frontiers of the fastest computers. The supercomputer was invented out of necessity and invented by mathematicians for mathematicians. The partial differential equation of the mathematical physicist is the most recurring decimal in fastest computing. The quest to use an electronic machinery to solve the ordinary differential equation of calculus that governs the trajectories of missiles was the difficult problem that motivated the invention of the first programmable computer. That computer was created in 1946 and at the Aberdeen Proving Ground that was 26 miles outside Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, the birthplace of my wife, Dale. That all vacuum tube supercomputer of 1946 used 18,000 vacuum tubes. My quest was for the fastest computer that could be used to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and physics. An example of such grand challenge problems include the initial boundary value problem of calculus that's governed by a system of coupled nonlinear and time-dependent partial differential equations that's always at the mathematical physics core of any computational fluid dynamics code. In particular, and for everyday uses, a system of partial differential equations is at the calculus algebra and physics core of the general circulation model that governs the motions of water and air that enshroud the earth. Such partial differential equations interest astrophysicists because they also govern the motions of the fluids that circulate around distant planets and stars. I invented Philip M. Aguale computer to be used to solve the most compute intensive problems that arise as extreme scale computational fluid dynamics modeling. A poster child of such grand challenge problems is the general circulation model within the Earth's concentric atmosphere that's represented by the domain of the arising initial boundary value problem. Another poster child of computational fluid dynamics is the supercomputer modeling of the limited air circulation of contagious viruses, in particular the simulation of a once-in-a-century global pandemic and how it spreads inside the 2,400 train sets of Spain's Madrid metro system. Each train packed passengers like sardines. The reason I talked about distant planets, stars and galaxies was that I was trained as an astronomer in the mid-1970s in Corvallis, Oregon, USA. 
I received my earliest job offers as an astronomer rather than as a computer scientist or mathematician or physicist. The reason was that the U.S. Office of Personnel Management rated me higher as an astronomer. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered the fastest execution of astrophysical and geophysical fluid dynamics codes. The movements of the eight planets around our sun obeys the laws of motion of physics. The ebb and flow of the tides of the water and air that enshroud the earth obeys the second law of motion described in physics textbooks. That second law of motion was discovered 330 years ago. The second law of motion was discovered in prose, but it was coded in algebra as force equals mass times acceleration or F equals MOA. My contributions to calculus were these. I reformulated the iconic formula F equals MOA into a system of nine coupled nonlinear and time dependent partial differential equations that govern subsurface motions of multi phase flows across a porous medium, such as the 65,000 oil fields around the world that include the supergiant oil fields in Venezuela, Kazakhstan, and Russia. My new system of nine equations governs the flow of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas flowing across an oil producing field that's up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and often the size of Onitsha, Nigeria. My contributions to algebra were these. I discretized those partial differential equations beyond the frontier of calculus into partial difference equations beyond the frontier of, of large-scale algebra. Furthermore, I reduced my algebraic formulation to computer codes. In 1989, I was in the news because I recorded the world's fastest computing. I did so by executing my 65,536 supercomputer codes at once and across and, within, and with a one-to-one -one correspondence with my ensemble of 65,536 processors. At its physics core, calculus is about changes and motions that range from the geophysical motions of the Earth's liquid outer core. That's very hot very dense to the astrophysical motions of distant stars. My quest was to theorize my governing system of coupled nonlinear and time dependent partial differential equations that encoded the fundamental laws of physics of fluid dynamics. I visualized my computational fluid dynamics codes not as executing within one processor, but as executing across my ensemble of 65,536 processors. I theorize each processor as parallel to each of my 65,536 divided atmospheres or as many blocks of oil fields. Those individual atmospheres completely and tightly enshrouded my geometric metaphor for the entire Earth's atmosphere. My geometric model was a concentric sphere that was 62 miles thick. That model had an inner diameter of 7,918 miles. My quest was to discover how I could harness and use my 65,000 536 equidistant processors to solve the most difficult problems in mathematics and physics. Towards that end, I visualize my processors as braided together around a globe and used to solve 64 binary thousand equally compute intensive problems and used to solve them with a one processor to one problem mapping and correspondence that preserved nearest neighbor proximities, which in turn was the mathematical precondition to my recording the world's fastest computing. 
In the early 1980s, my grand challenge was to invent the techniques and technologies to be used to solve initial boundary value problems and solve them with up to 1 billion processors and with a speed increase of 1 billion. My contribution to the mathematical solution of such compute intensive physics problem was the cover story of the flagship publications of top mathematics societies, including the May 1990 issue of the Siam News that is published by the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. My record-breaking sustained performance in computing was mentioned in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. My contribution to mathematics was that I turned that mathematical fiction of the fastest computing across the slowest processors into a non-fiction. That world's fastest computing is the new knowledge that I discovered that was used to upgrade the parallel computer to the stature of a supercomputer. The world's fastest computer of today became a non-fiction after my discovery that occurred at 15 minutes after 8 o'clock in the morning of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA. Thank you. I'm Philip Omaha. Thank you. Thank you very much. Insightful and brilliant lecture.